Hello Thriller Fest. My name is Jason Allison. I was slated to present at the ATF workshop, but unfortunately we're all in the situation we're in. So Kimberly Howe offered me an opportunity to give a streamlined version of my presentation to you guys via video. It's the first time I've done this, so please bear with me. Who am I? Um, I spent 20 years with the New York City Police Department. 12 of those were as a detective. Four of those, the last four, were as a member of a joint ATF NYPD task force. Uh, task force was called the Sparta Task Force. This is Sparta! Clever. Um, it stands for Special Pattern Armed Robbery Technical Apprehension. Basically, we investigated violent armed robbery crews and we used the federal government's leverage and the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, investigatory power to leverage those investigations and offshoot into other deeper investigations. Uh, we tried to close out homicides. We tried to close out complex criminal organizations. That was the goal. I think it worked pretty well. I'm also a huge fan of pop culture. I'm an aspiring writer. I was hoping to present two cases to you guys in the hopes that you might be able to take away something from the life that I led and what police do every day. You learn pretty early on who might have shot a guy, who might have killed a guy, who might have done a robbery. The problem is, is that much like in training day, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So in a lot of the robberies we investigated, perpetrators are wearing masks, they're wearing gloves, they don't leave DNA, they don't leave fingerprints. Uh, local district attorney's offices were reluctant to prosecute based on the evidence that we would accumulate. And the NYPD began working with federal partners, including the FBI, the DEA, and in our case, the ATF. So we're going to look at two cases. They're very similar in the terms of what was going on. Um, we got different breaks in them and the outcomes, the way we ended up finishing them off were different. First one is a case that I'm gonna call j -Law. This is a still image of, taken from one of the robberies of which there were 15 to 20. And I get a phone call from a former narcotics colleague of mine who has a confidential informant working in that area. That informant told the detective I know, hey, I know who's doing these robberies. He gives us subject's name, dates of the robberies, locations, and most importantly, gives us a cell phone number. We believe that the confidential informant was the drug dealer selling the suspect, the robbery suspect, heroin. We learned that he was previously arrested by the NYPD and the U.S. Attorney's Office for a similar spate of robberies that occurred a few years prior. The U.S. Attorney had to drop the charges. As a result, this time around, they want a great deal of evidence. Understandably so. They tell us to catch the guy dirty, meaning get him doing a robbery or in the immediate aftermath of a robbery. Now, that's a lot easier said than done. When you're in your office at One St. Andrews and you tell your detective or your agent, yeah, just, just arrest him when he's doing a robbery, that seems simple. The reality is far, far different. I don't want to shoot anyone. I never shot anyone. I never wanted to get shot. I still don't want to get shot. So if we can do it any other way, we try to. But in this particular instance, this is what we were given. We can't step to him too early because what if the gun is fake? Um, if he's running around with a fake gun, that's not really a crime. It's an administrative code violation in New York City. He would be issued a summons and then he would know we're onto him. We would lose the phone, which is our biggest weapon in this, and we would start over. We don't just run out, grab someone and bring him in and brace him um, because if the guy lawyers up, you have nothing. And Again, he knows what you know, and he knows that you're looking at him. There's nothing more embarrassing for a detective than knowing a guy in your office shot someone, killed someone. You talk to him, and you have to let him go. It is a big step to go from covert to overt. By the way, it's very important to understand the personal relationships that cops have with one another, and cops are fiercely protective of their informants because they know that other detectives and other cops aren't going to care about their informant. Cops are keep their informants close to the vest. So when you have two guys that are, or two girls that know each other, that goes a long way to building trust. So the informant says, hey, listen, he's going to rob a GNC store. So we set up to do surveillance. Surveillance is hard, really hard. Great example of surveillance in movies is French Connection. There's a great scene in there where they're trailing Frog 1. It's different now with cell phones and radios, but the substance remains the same. Um, surveillance in a major urban metropolitan area is extremely difficult. Additionally, surveillance in a city like New York City, um, 
where neighborhoods change in terms of their population and their demographics, that's a reality that we have to deal with as well. I'm going to stick out in certain neighborhoods in New York City. It's very hard to maintain a tail uh, from a vehicle of someone who's on foot. They can go into stores, they can throw a different jacket on, they can dip down an alleyway or go up a one way that we can't. So surveillance is real difficult. We're watching him watch a store. At one point he turns around, walks down the block, looks inside an unmarked car that had two ATF agents in it. He makes them, he knows what's up, he walks off. He might not have known that we were there for him. He got shook and he's gone. Thankfully, he doesn't drop the phone because if he had dropped the phone, we would have had trouble um, because our observations combined with the confidential informant's knowledge of what's going on is enough to, for us to get up on his phone. We get a pen register and a trap and trace. Pen register means that you get real time incoming and outgoing phone call data. You're not getting content. I'm not hearing what's going on on the call. That's a title three and the threshold for obtaining a T3 is exceedingly high. We don't have enough to get that in this case. And also, I don't think it would help us. Um, we also get a trap and trace. A trap and trace gives us periodic intermittent cell phone location. In a major city where there are buildings and tall buildings and there are so many cell phone towers, you sometimes get a radius of a hit of two, three, four hundred meters. Two, three, four hundred meters on a major shopping area in the Bronx is like a needle in a haystack. So you have to get lucky and one of those intermittent hits has to have a radius of about 10 meters or less for you to really have an idea where someone might be. We go back, we do re-interviews. Um, you gotta remember, police departments like any other organization, you have people that work hard and you have people that don't. There are gonna be detectives that conducted initial investigations and initial interviews that might not ask all the questions you wanna know. You have to go back, you have to redo a lot of the work. Witnesses forget things as well. Witnesses' accounts change because witnesses are not often reliable. And we try not to use witness IDs in our investigations because it, you're putting a lot on your witness. Also, video disappears, hard drives fill up, hard drives get overwritten. Some of these um, stores in poor communities can't afford to have uh, 100 terabyte hard drives. There's time and date discrepancies. I've had to subtract years from a date that's on a camera to get the time and date that I'm looking for. And it sounds ridiculous, but when you have a couple of cops in a drop ceiling trying to do the math of subtracting 18 months, three days, and four hours, it gets pretty comical. This is another image taken of surveillance of the subject. Um, another thing is that criminals aren't criminals 24 hours a day. Um, they're people. Uh, sometimes they have jobs, they have wives, they have kids, they have husbands, brothers, sisters, just because they're out and about doesn't mean that they're always doing something. Uh, while we're surveilling him, I call the subject. I asked for, I forget, Mary. I asked for someone that wasn't him. I watched him answer the phone, hang it up, um, put it away. There's a record of that phone call from my ATF phone to him. Um, there's me observing him answer that phone that connects him legally to the device. That's important. There's similarities in clothing, distinctive items worn at multiple locations. For instance, shoes don't often change. Um, we also start getting some security video from New York City housing development. We know where the uh, suspect is staying. We collect video um, shortly after the robberies of him returning, wearing clothes consistent with the robberies. Um, also, merely having an image of the perpetrator is not enough. Just because we have these photos here, I still need someone to be able to say, that is Jimmy Jones. We're finally able to get a search warrant for the apartment that we think he's staying in. We execute it. He's not there. The woman that lives there is a friend, an older woman. She says, oh yeah, he stays here. He keeps clothes here. I've seen him on a cell phone. We collect the clothing. Some of it matches items that are captured on security video, like what you're looking at right now. The resident at the search warrant location tells us that he recently took a bunch of clothes to his sister's residence. We go to the sister. We speak to her. She says that her brother called her twice before we showed up, and he told her, the cops are on to me, and this time they're going to get to me. She gives us more clothing that he recently brought over. These other clothing items match the robberies, some of the robberies as well. Later that day, the suspect calls me, says he knows that we're looking for him, and that he wants to meet. We pick him up. We read him his Miranda rights. We speak to him for hours. Um, he denies having a cell phone, he admits to heavy heroin use, and he also denies that the photos that I just showed you were him. And sometimes denials are as useful as admissions. If you can disprove a lie, 
that sometimes as good as proving the truth. No single piece of evidence is enough, but everything in total allows the U.S. Attorney's Office to charge him with four, I believe, of the 20 some odd robberies, because with phone data and the clothing we recovered, they were comfortable going forward. We leverage the resident into testifying in the grand jury. Sometimes it's distasteful. Everyone we encounter, we weigh as to see if they can help the case and if they have information. And even though they might be family members or friends or relatives, we try to convince them that they need to testify. And sometimes we give people subpoenas and we kind of put them into the grand jury against their wishes. We never recover the gun, by the way. Suspect and his lawyer want to see the evidence. We set everything out on a table, huge conference table. He comes in with his attorney. After that, he pleads guilty to a short prison sentence, followed by a much longer in-treatment drug program. About three years ago, he came back to my office. He recovered some of the items that we had seized. He was no longer using heroin. And to my knowledge, he hasn't been arrested since. And that's as much of a victory as we can get in our business. Second case study, very similar. Two men this time, robbing a bunch of gas stations, 7-Elevens, convenience stores, all throughout Queens. Queens is a big borough, if you don't know it. You see the photos here. Um, gloves, masks, in some cases, Tyvek suits, different outfits. They leave no DNA, they leave no prints. What's the pattern in this one? The car. It's a gray Honda Accord. Guys, an older crime narrowed down to model year 2008 to 2012, and it has a sunroof. Uh, it's either reported by witnesses or captured on video fleeing each robbery. In some of the robberies, witnesses are reporting license plates to us or partial plates. We do searches through a few databases where you can run partial plates. We don't get any hits that attach to a silver Honda Accord. Additionally, in some of the robberies, there are lottery tickets that are stolen. Um, New York State keeps a record of when those lottery tickets get cashed in. We get a hit on one of the lottery tickets taken in the robbery. It's a winner. It gets cashed in at another store. By the time we became aware of it, the video was gone. No help. All this information is going out to Crime Stoppers. We're hoping we get a phone call that a family member or friend knows, oh man, that's Johnny Jones. We don't get anything. 911 calls are helpful. But again, they're kind of choppy and less than perfect in the moment. Um, two months in, they rob a mobile gas station in Jamaica. Another license plate is provided by witnesses. This time, the license plate pans out. Sort of. I'm going to get to that in a minute. During the robbery, the bag man uh, takes cash, cigarettes, keys to several vehicles that are being worked on in the garage at the gas station, and a bunch of receipts. I don't know why he took the receipts. He just took a bunch of stuff that was off the counter, threw it in a plastic bag, he's out the door. We learned that that license plate was reported stolen the next day by the registered owner. We know that they are stealing license plates and using different plates to put on the car, which explains why none of the plates that we were being given associates to a Silva Honda Accord, as you see here. After the mobile robbery, there's a homeowner who's returning late at night to his house. He sees a Silva Honda parked on the street, but in blocking his driveway. He pulls up, the Honda takes off but not before they toss something out the window. And the next morning, he wakes up, he goes outside, he sees a black plastic bag on his front lawn. He looks inside, he sees BMW key fobs, a baseball hat, and receipts to a mobile gas station. We get a lot of breaks like this. There's, the city is loaded with decent people. He worries that the gas station might have lost the keys to, the, to this vehicle. So he calls them. The clerk that answers the phone says, oh yeah, I got robbed last night. They took that stuff. So what does this guy do? He calls 911 next. We take all the evidence, send everything to the lab. Reality about the lab is that things don't get processed quickly. You have a city of 78 police precincts, 12 transit districts, countless special units that you've never heard of, and everyone is submitting potential DNA to this one lab. Every commanding officer thinks that they're gonna solve every case with DNA. You're getting burglaries, sex crimes, homicides, shootings, grand larcenies, anything where someone touches something, we're swabbing and we're sending it in. But triaging all that incoming evidence is a difficult job. So it takes a long time for us to get anything back. In this case, it takes two months. The lab is able to generate a DNA profile from the baseball hat. It gets matched to a DNA profile obtained during a 2005 homicide investigation in Manhattan. It doesn't mean that he did the robbery, but it's somewhere to start. Turns out this suspect's on parole for robbery. Um, we get his parole information, and most importantly, he provided a cell phone to his parole officer because parolees have to answer up whenever their parole officer calls. 
we get all the records for that phone. His most frequent caller is to another robbery parolee. And just so it happens that that guy's mother is the registered owner of a silver Honda Accord four-door with a sunroof. These are our guys. Questions now is how do we prove it? When we go up on Baseball Hat's phone, just like we did in the previous case, we surveil the driver's residence until we get proof that he has access to the car. Because it's registered in his mother's name, we need to prove that he has keys or he drives it. Um, after a few days, I see him returning late at night, park the car, get out of it, and go into his building. That's enough to get us a GPS warrant. We get the warrant, we affix the GPS unit to the car. So now we're tracking the car, the cell phone and the car in person and electronically. Um, this time we're dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, the Eastern District. And like the first case, they tell us, just get them in the act. That's the best case. Easier said than done. I develop a theory that if we see a phone call between Baseball Hat and the guy with the car, and then we see the car moving to where Baseball Hat lives because they both live in Queens, but they live pretty far away. I'm gonna guess that a robbery is about to go down. That's what happens. I see a phone call, the car starts moving. Bunch of us, I get my team together. None of us are ready to do police work that day. You know, you have other cases as this is going on. You have other obligations. Some people have court. I had a bunch of paperwork to do that day. So whole team hustles out to Queens. We get NYPD guys to help us as well from Queens Robbery. Um, we locate the car, we start surveilling it, we're handing off the surveillance, they're driving around, they're looking for a place to rob. After a time they stop, the driver gets out, steps two blocks off, and he unscrews a license plate from a purple Plymouth Voyager. He sticks the plate in his shirt, goes back to the car, they drive off, a few more blocks, he gets out, goes to the back of the car, puts the stolen plate on the back of the Honda. We make a decision that we're going to stop him, we box him in. As I'm running up on the passenger, he has both hands in the air and he's screaming, it's a fake gun, it's a fake gun. He's wearing multiple layers of clothing. I pull a very realistic looking pistol off of him. Inside the car, we find surgical gloves, masks, the yellow rain suit that you saw earlier, and a few Tyvek cleaning suits. Baseball hat flips, he gives up the whole case. He ends up going to work for the DEA as an informant on a long-term investigation that they have going on. We use the federal system to promote cooperation to solve crimes that otherwise we wouldn't be able to get work done on. So that one worked out as well. No one got hurt. The robbery stopped. But like I said, we're not always prepared to do police work. This was not the outfit I would have liked to have arrested people in. But so it goes. This is my contact information. I'm an aspiring writer. Like I said, I would love to answer any questions uh, within reason. So you can feel free to email me. And I'm also on Twitter. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I wish we could have all met in person, but we can do that in July of 2021. Everyone stay healthy. I wish you all the best of luck on your projects and be well. Thank you.